For several years now, the small eastern Ontario city of Cornwall has had a cat crisis, and not a small one. It's been dealing with hundreds of wild or feral cats wreaking havoc in neighborhoods and the wider ecosystem. But as the TVO original documentary, Running Wild, the Cats of Cornwall, explores, this is not really a cat problem, but a human one. The documentary has its world premiere tonight, right after this program, and we're pleased that it brings to our virtual studio some of its key voices. From Cornwall, Ontario, Melissa Alpins. She is the founder of Tiny But Mighty Kitten Rescue. In Guelph, Ontario, Elizabeth Gao, adjunct professor in the Department of Integrative Biology at the University of Guelph. And in the Corsa Italia neighborhood of the provincial capital, there's Aaron Hancocks. He's the director and writer of the documentary Running Wild, the Cats of Cornwall. Uh, nice to have you all on our program tonight. And uh, Aaron, uh, kudos to you. This is a terrific documentary. You've really captured the problem uh, in its essence. I want to understand, though, what, uh, what compelled you to make the documentary in the first place? Thank you for having me, Steve. Uh, our company, Markham Street Films, uh, had been really interested in exploring the idea that cats were an, an invasive species. And uh, it just so happened that the situation in Cornwall popped on my radar and the stars aligned and we had a film. So you're not from Cornwall, you didn't grow up there, you don't have that connection? My family all lives in the Ottawa area, which is very close. So I think they, they probably shared with me the, the news of Cornwall. So I can have them to thank for it. Gotcha. Now, the cats that, uh, in question here, feral cats, domestic cats, all of the above, what? Yes, domestic cats are really the species, and uh, feral cats are unowned cats that live outdoors. And we're dealing with really any cat that lives outdoors, whether it be feral, an owned pet that goes outside. But uh, feral cats are particularly problematic. Okay, let's take a little snippet of what you've been able to create, and then we'll come back and chat some more. Sheldon, if you would, the clip. They were just found loose in the plant. Yeah, our forklift guy, he thought it was rats. <coughs> it's horrible, right? <laughs> How old are you? You look like my other babies. Yeah, you have teeth. Good baby. <laughs> So somehow they're making their way in here. They're having their litters or they're being dropped off. We used to take them home, but yeah, you, know, you can't take them all home. That's the I know. problem. Melissa makes a, uh, a starring appearance in that clip there. We'll talk to her a little more in a second, but let's still set this up. Uh, Elizabeth, you're the pro in this picture, and I, I, I guess we need to understand, how did Cornwall get to be the feral cat capital of the province? Yeah, well, the situation in Cornwall is... Uh, kind of an extreme example of what can happen when a whole variety of different factors kind of come together. So we, one of the things we think about is the human elements in issues with cats. And so cats that are outside, those are cats that, as Aaron mentioned, that people put outside. They're cats that don't have owners. And so what's happened in Cornwall is people have put their cats outside that um, aren't spayed and neutered. There's cats that people dump outside when they don't want them. And those cats freely reproduce. And so they have a lot of babies. And those babies, we get hundreds and hundreds of babies a year um, from multiple cats, or actually thousands in the case of Cornwall. And so the situation in Cornwall is we just have a lot of cats that are outside and they're causing nuisance in people's yards. They're hunting um, animal, wild animals. And they're just a big problem because when we have a lot of a species that doesn't belong in, a, in an area, that creates a lot of problems. So this is what they mean in the documentary when they say it's, it's not really a cat problem, it's a human problem, right? People are, it's, yes. it, it, people are at fault here. Yeah, it, it is our fault. Um, you know, it's not the cat's fault. It really is our fault for not taking responsible ownership of our pets, uh, for for not not really <laughs> taking the value that cats need in our society. So it, it's a societal problem and it's a people problem. And it's also an economic problem. There's other aspects involved, such as it's really expensive to spay and neuter your cat um, unless it's subsidized. So a lot of people can't afford it. And if you're putting your cat outside and it's not spayed or neutered, that doesn't lead to the best situation where that cat can reproduce. Um, it can come in contact with other cats. There may spread disease. It, there's a wide variety of different problems that can come, arise out of this. Mm -hmm. Now, Elizabeth and Aaron, you're not going to take offense if I say this, but I'm saving the best for last here, which means Melissa. 
Melissa, I got to say, you are doing God's work. I mean, you, you rescue you. these cats. You love these cats. You try to get them placed in permanent homes. You take care. I mean, it's, it's clear. It's clear you're, um, I mean, you, you are just in love with, with these little helpless animals. And I see one of them making a cameo in the background already, which is wonderful. But I need to know, yeah. why do you do it? Why do I do it? I love cats. And I previously volunteered at our local shelter, and I figured out that they were euthanizing little orphan kittens. Um, so w I tried to let them, I tried to figure out how to let them foster. Like I would, I was willing to pay for it, but unfortunately they denied me. So I started my own rescue and this is where we are. Do you have any idea how many cats you've rescued and, and seen back to health already? My numbers are low because I don't, intake a lot of kittens at a time to avoid like super high vet bills and spreading disease. But I'm pretty close to 100 right now. And over what period of time would that be? Um, since 2017. And how many cats have you got in the house right now? There's only two right now who um, were found in a backyard and they're orphan kittens because they don't know where the mother is. And if you didn't do what you do, Melissa, what do you think the impact would be? Well, my main focus is to rescue the orphans in the town. And actually, I'd taken kittens from around the areas too, but there's no really help for orphan kittens. Um, so that's what I try to focus on. Um, some, like, I guess the kittens um, need help, obviously, because their mothers are missing or they've been hit by a car or something tragic like that. So I take in um, the orphans when I can. And just to be clear, you're, you're, like, th this is not a job for you. No one's paying you to do this, I presume, right? No, this is all volunteer work. Volunteer work out of the goodness of your heart. Yeah. Well, good for you. That's great. Aaron, what, um, maybe you could describe for us, what's been the city of Cornwall's approach to this problem? Uh, my understanding is that in 2008, the, the city made a concerted effort to try and, and, and fix the problem, partnering with the OSPCA, a uh, charitable organization, and that at a certain point, uh, the OSPCA and the city just ran out of resources and steam and said, this is really beyond our capacity to, 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 to fix this problem. And as uh, um, Dr. Gao mentioned, when when the, 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 the problem exists, it can spread exponentially because cats breed so much. So it, if it's left unchecked, it just runs wild. And, and that's what happened is over the past 10 or 12 years, this situation just became uh, so bad that it reached a crisis level. That it started making uh, news headlines, which is, of course, how I found out about it and found out about Melissa's work. Hmm. In which case, Elizabeth, why don't more people spay or neuter their cats? If they did, presumably this problem goes away. Yeah, it's a very it's a very complicated situation because it's expensive to spare new to your cat. Um, it takes time, and a lot of people don't have those resources. So the problem with with cats is we often think of them as a bit of dispendable animals. We treat them a little bit that we treat them quite differently than dogs. So people sometimes that. They want a pet, they don't have a lot of money, so they get a cat. But to spay and neuter a cat, we're talking uh, sometimes a few hundred dollars. That's a lot of money for some people. And so we really need um, subsidized spay and neuter to, to get people to be able to spay and neuter their cats. And also bringing that spay and neuter, for instance, to clinics um, or even a mobile spay and neuter uh, unit close to where people are that really need it. So it's, it's quite complicated, but it's... Um, you know, we need to provide the resources to help people get their cats spayed and neutered. In which case, Melissa, pr presumably entreaties have been made to the city council in Cornwall to help subsidize a spay and neutering program. Uh, what's been the effect of that? Well, it's been a little difficult with COVID. I think it has delayed their entire plan to bring the mobile clinic more frequently. Um, and I know the shelter has been closed since March, as far as I'm aware. So they've been directing people to my rescue, which has been difficult. Um, and I guess we just have to continue waiting for the mobile clinic to come back when they can. Hmm. Now, you live in Cornwall, right? Yes. So you're on the ground. You'd be able to best answer this question. How do the people in Cornwall feel about the fact that cats are running all over their city? Uh, there are certain parts of the city where it's pretty bad. Um, you have to see them at certain times of the day because when it's cold, they're hiding, and when it's super hot, they're hiding. Um, but it is bad. Um, we're just, I guess, 
we're thankful that the city has finally helped us and put money in the budget for the year. Um, but hopefully moving forward, they'll continue to put money in every year um, hmm. for the budget. Now, Elizabeth, I want to ask you about an expression that Aaron used at the top of our interview tonight, and that is he described cats in Cornwall as, quote, unquote, an invasive species. Mm -hmm. That is that is not how we tend to think of cats. You know, we think of invasive species as, uh, I don't know what, bugs infesting agriculture or trees or something like that, but not yeah. cats in cities. What, what, why that expression? Well, it... <laughs> A lot of people, we don't think of cats as invasive species because there are pets, there are companion animals, there are family members, but when cats are outside, they're very wild. And they're actually, cats are very recently evolved from their ancestors, which are African wild cats. So we think of African wild cats are a small cat that look almost identical to some of the cats that we have in our houses that roam the Sahara and they roam Africa. And... So the cats that we have are very much like those cats. So they have this wild side to them. And when we put cats outside, they're not from North America. They've come over here with uh, the colonization of North America several hundreds of years ago. And so they're very similar to a lot of these other species that we think of, a purple loosestrife or emerald ash borel beetle, uh, that are invasive species. They don't belong here. Then they're outside. They cause huge environmental impacts. In Canada alone, cats kill 100 to 350 million. So that's millions of birds every single year, which is astronomical. They spread disease. Uh, they spread disease to other cats. They spread disease to wild animals. And they can even spread it to humans. So they can spread it to us, such as toxoplasmosis, which is a parasite. And that gets into the environment. And, and that spreads to us. It spreads to other animals. And that's actually found all over the world. And that's from cats. So they're a huge problem. And we don't tend to think of them as invasive species because they're our pets. But when they're outside, they're very wild. And they're like a wild predator that we've suddenly put into our environment. Now, Elizabeth, presumably they're, they're killing a lot of mice and rats, too. we got to be happy about that, aren't we? Yeah, so cats do kill some of these pest animals, but what um, scientists have found is that they actually kill even more native species. So in Ontario, these are our voles, these are our moles, um, and chipmunks, and sometimes squirrels and rabbits. And so these are species that are originally found here, and they're important for the health of our environment. And cats are capturing those animals at even higher rates than they are a pest species. So those are uh, mice and, and rats. So it's quite concerning when cats are actually hunting all the species we want. Um, and, and that's not a good thing. Hmm. Now, Erin, you've obviously chronicled the situation in Cornwall. Uh, but I presume Cornwall isn't the only place in the province of Ontario where this is an issue. Where else might it be a problem? Uh, honestly, the, the situation in Cornwall is really indicative of a situation that's problematic all over the world. Um, wherever a city hasn't taken really decisive action to solve this problem, it will become an issue. Because as Elizabeth has said, uh, cats are not thought of the same way as dogs. And people think that cats are independent and they can just be left outside. So I know that, for example, Hamilton has a, 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 a cat, a feral cat problem on their hands, as, as well as many other places around Ontario, Canada, and the world. When you say a feral cat problem, uh, like, I'm from Hamilton. When I go back to the city, I, I, I must confess, I don't see cats running all over the city. So wh where is it a problem? Well, actually, in East End Hamilton, um, I was actually uh, doing research, and I went into certain neighborhoods. There's alleyways where there are dozens of cats uh, that live, live in the alleyways around there. Um, it, it's a colony. And um, I think the idea with feral cats is you, you wouldn't actually notice them if you were just to walk down downtown Hamilton because feral cats do their very best usually to avoid human contact unless they're being fed by a, a known uh, feeder to them. So it actually made it difficult for us to film feral cats because they, they didn't trust us. We had to wait in, in alleyways and behind houses and set up hidden cameras to get images of these cats. And that's what makes it very tough and what makes Elizabeth's work very tough is to get good estimates on the number of cats. But there they are there. I believe, believe it. Oh, yeah, no, I do believe it. So just, just so I'm straight here, feral cats, bad. Tiger cats, good, though, right? 
<laughs> Tiger Cat's good, absolutely. Very good. Okay, <laughs> just just to, for the CFL fans, I want to be clear about that. Melissa, I do want to ask you, as um, you know, as a cat lover, how do you feel about cats being described as an invasive species in your city? <laughs> uh it's not ideal i guess um but it is true like there is too many cats in cornwall and other areas um that need help so that they don't reproduce out in the streets and cause uh tons of orphan kittens who can't get help now i should just check because <laughs> i keep yeah. seeing your your uh, very adorable cats in the background in the shot there are the two cats that are there right now are they cats that you have rescued and intend to place or are they yours they are not mine. They are my foster kittens right now. Uh, they are Carter and Owen, who came from a house. Um, they found them randomly all over their property, two little kittens. There might be more, but they didn't find them. Um, and they don't know where the mother is, so I took them in. And when you foster them, how long will you keep them for? Uh, depends right now because of the vet uh, appointment delays. Um, but usually they leave around 12 weeks, give or take. They leave around 12 weeks old. Now, I notice in the documentary, when it comes time for you to give the cats up, um, like, you take it in stride. Uh, you, you, you're not crying. You're not uh, moping about uh, all over this, which is, I guess, a bit of a surprise, because I'd, I'd have thought that you'd become fairly attached to them when you foster them for that length of time. How come? Uh, there was a clip that must not have been shown where I was crying. It is tough sometimes to let them go. Uh, because I literally love them like my own until they they go to their families. But um, it is tough. So despite what was shown, it is still tough on me. Okay, so you're taking issue with Aaron's portrayal of you right now. Is that it? <laughs> <laughs> I, I asked him not to use the clip of me crying, so it's not his fault. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Why didn't you want the clip of you crying in there? It was just rough. That adoption was just rough. I get you. I get you. Now, yeah. Carter and Owen, why those names? I don't know. The names just came to me. I always like wait a bit to see what names fit them. And Carter and Owen were just the ones that I chose for them. Huh. Okay. Elizabeth, let me get you back in here right now. What, um, what is the province of Ontario able to do on this that it so far has not yet done? Well, uh, unfortunately, the issue of, of cats and what we can do isn't necessarily something the provincial government takes action to. It's usually done in, in local cities. So each municipality in Ontario is responsible for the, the bylaws and, and all, sort of all the aspects of controlling sort of human behavior related to cats. But there's a lot that um, I think we as like cat owners and just the general public can do, and that is really again, as I, I've mentioned, is thinking about cats a, a bit differently. Thinking about them as, as our companion animals that we have a responsibility for, that we have to um, we have to provide enrichment for these cats. We have to uh, engage them in our homes so that they aren't being put outside. And so it, it's not necessarily something that say our, our government can do, but it's something that we as individuals have to take a lot of action. And sometimes that gets miscommunicated that it's not it's something that we as every single citizen in Ontario whether we're a cat owner or not has to really take action on on this issue and, and especially when we do have a cat of trying to keep it indoors hmm. now Aaron you having looked at this issue obviously and having made the documentary uh, have you come up with uh, some ideas for potential solutions to all of this yes I, I think it's a situation where um, a lot of municipalities don't want to pay to fix the problem. Uh, fix, pardon the pun. <laughs> but uh, um, it's one of those situations where if you don't uh, fix a problem, it will only get worse and only get more expensive. So I don't think it's a question of should money be allocated. It's a question of how much and when. And earlier is better. Um, it just cannot go unchecked. And um, if there's a, a situation where the um, the tax base of a town or a municipality doesn't have the funds or it's an impoverished area, then the, the city needs to dig deep and, and help because this problem cannot go unchecked. Now you, the, the risks are too great. Right. You, you do tell a story in the documentary which is really disturbing, which is some feral cats outdoors and some neighbor decides that the best way to solve this problem is simply to poison the cats. Now, uh, presumably that's illegal, but how much of that is going on right now to the best of your knowledge? 
anecdotally, there's a lot of that going on uh, um, anywhere. Uh, certainly in Cornwall, we heard about it. We heard about uh, poisoning, shooting, uh, and probably more common is uh, where uh, an unwanted cat is trapped and then released in the wild. And the outcome for that cat is uh, arguably worse than any other outcome because that cat will be forced to hunt for itself, fend for itself, and most likely become victim of a, of a coyote, frankly. So there's all kinds of terrible fates that uh, unowned cats can have, which is why people like Melissa take them in a, at a, a young enough age to try and socialize them so they can become pets rather than, than feral cats. Well, in fact, I learned in your documentary that if you're an inside cat, so-called inside cat, your lifespan's 12 to 18 years, but if you have to fend for yourself on the street, it's two to five years. So the cat's obviously going to have a better, healthier, happier, everything, life, longer, uh, if, if we do our part. I mean, that's one of the lessons here, isn't it, Aaron? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, my personal opinion is that cats should be kept indoors. And while I do find that sad because, as Elizabeth said, these are essentially wild animals. I, I think they would prefer to be outside. I don't think we can afford to do that environmentally. Um, and so then it becomes really a question of what can we do to make this cat's indoor life uh, as pleasing as possible. And I think cat, it, it is work. Yeah, a lot of people think owning a cat is easy. You just they fend for themselves, they go outside, they entertain themselves. But if you have a in, purely indoor cat, it's actually a lot of work to give that cat a ha happy life. You have to entertain it and stimulate it and play with it a lot. I thought cats were supposed to be left alone and dogs were supposed to be played with. <laughs> no. No, far from it. I mean, I have a, I have two rescue cats of my own. Uh, they were both born feral, and um, it is work. I'm working from home these days because of COVID, and I... Uh, there's a lot of meowing going on. There's a lot of breaks I have to take to entertain them. Uh, otherwise, they won't leave me alone. Um, and it's it's like um, they're really. I mean, they're like humans in the sense that humans need uh, activity. What if you took a human and said you can never leave the house? Well, I guess we're in that situation now with COVID. But <laughs> you have to stay at home and you can't get any exercise. Um, uh, cats are wild animals, really, or half wild animals. They need that stimulation. Um, and so, yeah, we really owe it to them. And, all, you know, there's other indications. If, if a cat doesn't want to play, it doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't want to play. It just might mean it's given up and it's depressed and, and it, it doesn't, it's understimulated. Hmm. Now, we met Carter and Owen already. What are your cat's names? Um, you, I think you may have seen a, a tail cameo at one point, mm -hmm. but my cat's names are Bo and Fig. And named after whom? Um, Bo was uh, uh, actually... Um, uh, an abbreviation of his uh, his uh, foster name, so I can't really take full credit, but it's B E A U. He's a very handsome cat. He's ah. he's fluffy, fluffy and black and, and majestic, and he's French. And um, and Fig is because my uh, my wife is Italian and uh, she loves uh, Mediterranean fruits. I guess. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, and what do you mean, Bo is French? <laughs> uh, I'm just joking. He has okay. uh, he has a French name. It kind of suits him. He's uh, you know. He, he He's has perfect. a joie de vivre, I understand. Okay, gotcha. Absolutely. Now, Elizabeth, I should get you to weigh in on, on this debate to the extent that there is a debate. Home cats, 12 to 18 years. Feral cats, mm -hmm. two to five years. What, it, does science prefer one over the other? Uh, well, it's, you know, as Aaron has kind of brought up, it, it's a tricky thing because cats have this, this sort of wild side. They have this very companion animal side. Some people actually call cats wild companions uh, because they have this wild side. They have this companion side. So it's, it, it's really hard for, for cat owners. I, I, I started, when I started working with cats, I thought, okay, all cats should be inside. There's no kind of other option. But when I've worked with cat owners, they're often very conflicted because they know how much their cat loves going outside. And, and I can, I can really feel what they're going through as at two o'clock in the morning, their cat's meowing to go outside and all you want to do is put your cat outside. So it's really hard to change that behavior of your cat when you have a cat that is an outdoor cat to get it to be indoors. So that's really hard. But what a lot of people do is they get their next cat. That's going to be their indoor cat. And so that's what we're trying to really encourage people to do is that maybe you can't get your current cat to be indoors, but if you can get your next cat to be indoors and provide it with stimulation, as Aaron was mentioning, things that stimulate um, 
or simulate the behavior that has outdoors. So that's climbing, that's um, hunting behavior. So it's playing with the cat. And another thing that cat owners can do is they can create catios. And these are actually enclosures, like a little fenced in enclosure that you can have outside. And even if you live in an apartment, people will make these little enclosures on their windows or their, um, their decks for the cat to go in. So then they're actually getting um, exposure to the outdoors. They're seeing things go by. They're seeing the animals. They're, they're getting fresh air. So it's kind of like their little, little cage outside. And so these are things that cat owners can do. And I think it's really important to remember in, if you do have a cat to think about sort of the, the costs and benefits of uh, putting your cat outside. So there are benefits and in, in people put their cats outside because they get more exercise. They It's part of who they are in many ways to be outside. They don't like being contained. But the downfall of have, being outside is that cats, when um, they they hunt, they capture wild animals, which are not good for the, the health of our environment. And they also can be hit by cars. They can be eaten by coyotes. Um, they can spread disease to themselves, other, um, other wild animals, to humans. And they can get in fights. And so their lives outside are, are actually not that good, particularly when we're talking about feral cats that spend their entire lives outside. It's not really that good for them. They're not meant to be in this environment in, in the winter, which we're going into now. Cats don't have a good coat of fur to actually survive our winters very well. And so in, in Southern Ontario, we don't get super extreme winters, although you know some people may say they are. But if you go to other parts of Canada, um, in the prairie provinces where it gets really cold, like minus 30, some of those cats literally freeze to death huh. because they're not adapted to being outside. And as you do see cats that have ears frozen off or they have frostbite on their, their paws, which is really concerning from a, a welfare side of seeing these cats that are outside. And, and they're actually very unwell. Well, I want to thank the three of you for uh, coming on to TVO tonight and for participating in the making of the documentary because it's, it's just excellent and people are going to not only learn a lot, but of course they're going to fall in love with some of the people and animals that are in this documentary. Uh, Running Wild, The Cats of Cornwall, on right after this program tonight. Aaron, Melissa, Elizabeth, great of you to join us on TVO. Thanks so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Steve. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.